Salutations brothers and sisters, today we will continue where we left off and mention several other famous witchers from the books, namely the last witchers of the School of the Wolf. The School of the Wolf was historically seated in the Kaer Moran Fortress located in the empty wilderness of northern Kedwin. Its name roughly translates to Old Sea Fort, though not for the reason you may think. because. While Kaer Morin is located about as far from any sea in the world as is possible, fossilized remains of ancient sea creatures were allegedly unearthed when its foundations were laid, proving that oceans did indeed once cover most of the continent. When and by whom said foundations were laid is unknown, but due to its name being a non-standard bastardized version of the elder speech, I would say it's pretty safe to assume it was not built by elves, but rather by men, a hypothesis that is also supported by its design and general visuals. Kaer Morin is placed on the side of a tall mountain, surrounded by dense forests and treacherous canyons, with no real roads leading to it and only a few scant forest pathways carefully concealed between the trees providing access to the few chosen individuals who reside in it. The fort was specifically designed to remain hidden from prying eyes, it would appear, which supports my theory that it was built by the sorcerers who first invented the witchers. It is a very utilitarian structure, boasting few decorations on both the inside and the outside. It has a moat a half-ruined outer wall and an adequately dilapidated inner wall, a courtyard with a training ground, a large main hall, several dozen bedchambers, several mostly unusable guest rooms, an expansive library, a kitchen and a larder, packed with supplies for the winter. There is also a training road encircling the entire perimeter of the fort, known by senior witchers as the Witcher's Trail but commonly known by the adepts simply as the Gauntlet. And it is a very demanding track, a very dangerous one as well, with wooden logs, mud pits, crevices and all manner of other obstacles around it, and its sole purpose is to push young witchers to their limit, to really force them to improvise and be creative when dealing with natural obstacles. Because once you enter the Gauntlet, the only way back is to finish the gauntlet. Even a single run is extremely challenging, and young novices were often made to take the gauntlet several times a day if they wished to pass the training. Hearing all this, you might be wondering how many witchers inhabit such a mighty fortress. I mean, it does sound like it was built to house a small army, right? So, how many witchers reside in it? during the winter and during the summer. A hundred? Two hundred? A thousand, perhaps? Well, the grand total number of all witchers still spending their winters in the old fort at the start of the books is... drumroll please... Five. No, that is a bummer if I ever heard one, right? I mean, why do five witchers even man the fortress? How do they sustain it? Who does the maintenance? The answer is mostly no one, since none of its residents are permanent and even during the winters the current population barely has the time to maintain their own beds, not to mention the rest of the old keep. But surely the fortress no was not built for five men, was it now? No, no, you are right, it was not, but you might as well be thankful there are as many manning it. To elaborate, several decades before the beginning of the series, Kaer Morin was the largest and quite possibly the oldest witcher fort in the northern realms. It served as training ground for several dozen novices with at least 20 senior witcher masters stationed in the keep at all times, training the acolytes and protecting Kaer Morin library and, perhaps even more importantly, the laboratory where the new witchers were created and which held all the secrets of bioengineering the original sorcerers who created the witchers had gathered. The fort was still not garrisoned heavily, by most standards at least, 
but it was never Kaer Morin's main defense line. That honor went to its secretive location and difficult terrain surrounding it, making it difficult for any army to get even near the fortress, let alone besiege it. Yet one army still did, or rather, not an army, but a mob. A mob of angry, self-righteous and, most importantly, terrified peasants and villagers. Afraid, you might ask? Afraid of what? Well, children, this is right about the time that the hideous ball of slander, propaganda and gossip known as Monstrum or the portrayal of a witcher was published, and its copies spread like wildfire throughout the north going mostly unchallenged by anyone who read them, and so the portrayal of witchers as bloodthirsty, sadistic rapists with a taste for human blood quickly solidified in the minds of ordinary folk. And so, guided by anger, fear and bloodlust of their own, a large mob assembled in northern Kedwen and marched over the mountains to the hidden secretive fort of the witchers in the middle of the woods, breaching the gates, storming the walls, and hero- Yeah, you're not buying this either, are you? No. I mean, come on. How could an ordinary mob of scrawny peasants who can barely organize themselves for a single night conduct a march over hostile terrain for several days or weeks, perhaps, trying to find a hidden fortress they could not have had knowledge of, as it was one of the most precious witcher secrets in the world. Not something even a drunken witcher would go around talking about to random strangers, and even if they did know the location, navigating such a force in the narrow monster-filled mountains of Kedwani wilderness is a feat beyond the scope of mere angry blob of farmers with torches and pitchforks. Kermoran is miles from the nearest settlement, so any starting point for the mob would have been a significant distance away. This speaks of a much higher level of organization by whoever was leading the villagers. And this brings me to my theory that the entire attack was just an elaborate cover-up of the real purpose of said attack. To kill the sorcerers responsible for creating the witchers and, if at all possible, steal their research and equipment. But who could have the skills, the resources, the motivations and the know-how for such an operation? Why, <laughs> of course, other sorcerers. You need to understand Mage society is so rife with scheming, plots, hidden motivations, double agents and triple agents and quadruple agents that Francis Underwood doesn't touch that crap with a meter-long pole. It is cutthroat politics taken to its natural extreme, and if a mage dies, most often another mage is responsible for his or her death. And while we have no specific names or motivations, it is not difficult to imagine why some mages might have wanted the uh, the witchers destroyed. Hexers make excellent assassins, agents, and even special forces if used correctly. And should they ever enter the services of the wrong people, they might very well be the reason for deaths of many, many mages. And it is childishly simple for a mage to write a book especially one as layman and unprofessional as Monstrum. Organizing the mob is not that difficult either, especially if, as I suspect was the case, you have trained mercenaries leading them and seeking out the most difficult opponents. Triss Merigold, notably, supports these claims when describing the massacre, citing the participation of sorcerers as the primary reason why she was reluctant to describe the massacre to a young Siri. She did not feel guilt over the actions of other wizards, but was also not certain that she, being a sorceress, was the right person to describe the conflict to the little witcheress. As Triss asserts, it was a mage who broke the gates of Kaer Morin, letting the flood of angry peasants and hired killers into the old fort. And witchers aren't soldiers. Sure, one on one, and even five on one, an average soldier has little chance to defeat a full-blown witcher. But the monster hunters are not trained or equipped to fight in a medieval battle. They carry no shields, 
don't know how to use pole arms, don't usually carry ranged weapons, have only the most basic magical training and, most importantly, every one of them is designed to fight solo. Teamwork, while it can be done excellently at times, does not come naturally to witchers, and neither does fighting against locked formations, even loose ones made up of starving peasants. Send three witchers against a troll and watch the carnage unfold. Send them against a well-disciplined formation with spears and shields, and most likely at least one will die in the process. Not even mentioning the high chance of bounty hunters being dispersed amongst the mob, or the sorcerers themselves, whose magical talents likely negated the only real advantage the witchers had, their own mages. And considering there were only about 20 actual witchers stationed in the keep, the old masters, the teachers and the laboratory operators, and the rest of the resistance was made up of young pupils and initiates, the battle quickly turned into a slaughter. At its end, all the sorcerers, all the novices, and all the witchers present lay dead, sprawled amidst the bodies of hundreds of brutalized villagers. One witcher, a lowly fencing master, managed to survive, by simple fortune of not being there, might I add. Yet they could not find the hidden laboratory or the equipment stored in it, so the probable primary purpose of the entire art attack was for naught. The rest, however, was quickly put to the torch, and upon his return, Vesemir witnessed all he had ever held dear, consigned to flame and ash, all because of primal superstition and political ambitions of the elites. After the slaughter, Vesemir attempted to salvage what was left of the ruins, spending hours looking for survivors and surveying the damage to the old fortress. He found none. An entire new generation of witchers, along with the most senior members of their clan, slaughtered in an evening. It worse still was that the sorcerers and witchers responsible for the laboratory lay among the dead, taking their secrets to their graves. Understand. The sorcerers never really trusted their creations with the secrets of making more witchers, only teaching each of the masters a part of the process. Vesemir only knew the basics of the entire mutating part of the transformation, and could only bolster that knowledge with what little the mages wrote down on the subject when he found the hidden laboratory. And so, it fell to Vesemir, now the most senior member of the School of the Wolf, to rebuild his order as much as he could. But no more witchers were ever created at Kaer Morin. This is probably the part where you're asking, just who the hell is this Vesemir anyway? And why is he important? Vesemir is the father every one of us would have liked to have, probably. He is, at the beginning of the books, several hundred years old, a senior even by witcher standards, and he is definitely the oldest witcher still alive. There is some speculation as to whether he was one of the absolute first witchers, but there is evidence in the books and in games that makes that somewhat unlikely, but all agree that he is definitely a living relic of another time. Vesemir got his start like all other witchers of the School of the Wolf did, likely being taken to the fortress as a child, subjected to witcher's training, trial of grasses and mutations, and coming out of them stronger, faster overall deadlier than he was before. We only know very little about Vesemir's early life. In the games, there are suggestions he may have been romantically involved with an oxen for noblewoman at one point, but Sapkowski himself doesn't actually give any backstory whatsoever, apart from his shared history with the younger witchers. What we do know is that Vesemir was smart enough, strong enough, and lucky enough to survive everything life threw at him, and eventually grew to what even witchers consider advanced age. How old, you ask? Well, consider the following. In the books, it is once mentioned Geralt is going through a sort of midlife crisis, and considering Geralt is about a hundred years old at the time, this would put, put a witcher's average natural lifespan anywhere from 300 to 450 years. Yeah, 
that is a long time. An even more impressive feat is that, despite his age, Vesemir still looked to be in his rough 50s or 60s, and had a body and stamina many a young man would envy him. His age, more than his body, showed in his mindset. Vesemir is a textbook definition of a stereotypical pensioner, extremely traditionalist, socially and morally conservative in pretty much everything, from professional conduct with other people to minute details like how to properly set a werebub trap. Like Geralt, Vesemir has pretty much seen it all at this point in his life, but unlike Geralt, Vesemir has coped with it in a much more rigid, traditional manner. He created for himself stern rules and patterns of behavior, which he believes help a man remain sane and effective even while living a life as dangerous and long as his is. He does almost everything by the book, and his Witcher code, while not written in stone, might as well be. Nevertheless, it is this rigidness and stoicism that gave the ability to persevere and survive for as long as he did, and most importantly, it was these qualities, as well as his patient, calm demeanor, and an inbred sense of discipline and fair play that eventually made him a permanent fencing master at Kaer Morhen, where he helped raise generations of new witchers from dirty, half-starved peasant boys to fully-fledged professional monster hunters. One of these boys he collected from the sorceress Visina, after he presumably saved the life of her lover and father of her child, Corin. After some time, Vesemir took the boy from his parents, or wherever else Geralt was at the time, to Kaer Morhen, where the young lad was subjected to all manner of horrible mutations and experiments, just as all the other young initiates. Unlike many of the other initiates, this one was a stubborn, tough little soldier, who, even subjected to additional mutations and experiments, simply would not die. This stubbornness and the talent earned him a lot of sympathy from the old Vesemir, who probably saw a lot of himself in the young boy, and so he took the lad under his personal wing and let him choose his name. The boy chose the name Geralt, Geralt of Rivia. Vesemir became a father to Geralt in almost every sense of the word, and he is one of the very few people in this world whose opinions and judgments still matter to Geralt which just goes to show how much respect the fencing master could earn from his pupils. He taught the young Geralt all he could about fencing, tracking, riding, reading, writing, alchemy and meditation, but most importantly, he taught him what it means to be a witcher and, even more importantly perhaps, what it means to be a good person. And while he could sometimes be a harsh teacher, and did not exactly use kids' gloves when dealing with his students, he nevertheless was never rude or condescending to them. He would, and frequently did, mock them and yell at them if they made mistakes, but not with malicious intent, but rather so that they could better remember not to repeat such a mistake. He is, in a word, a true teacher and a true parent, even if he is biologically incapable of having children. And he wasn't a father to only Geralt. During his training, there was a boy that was almost inseparable from the young white wolf, a child so like Geralt in both appearance and mannerism, at least initially, that the only way people could tell them apart was by looking at their hair color, and even that only in latter years, for other boys' hair was black as pitch, where Geralt's hair was already snow white. They were like brothers in every sense of the word, going through the entire training together, helping each other and generally just being incredibly alike. And the name this young boy chose for himself was Esco. Eskel can best be described as a bro. He is almost a carbon copy of Geralt, except for his hair and large, ugly scar that later came to adore his cheeks. He was said to be even calmer, more relaxed than Geralt, making him more similar to Vesemir in that regard, and was somewhat more cordial and less direct with his opinions, preferring to keep his thoughts to himself even in situations in which Geralt would probably have said something. This manner makes him seem quite a bit more diplomatic, and even in a situation in which his fellow witchers are lost for words, Eskel can always be counted upon to remember his manners and effuse even the most awkward of silences. 
Ironically, when it comes to love interest, Eskel usually played second fiddle to Geralt, whose more gruff and direct demeanor seemed to sit much better with most women. The way all women look at him is frankly irritating. Additionally, he is no slouch with the blade either, and is presumably more magically potent, at least according to Triss. In the games, Eskel's story is expanded upon a little bit with the additions of Deirdre and Scorpion, but I will not get into that here right now. So for now, I can only say that Eskel is basically a more quiet, collected and calm version of Geralt, and he's probably the person Geralt looks forward to seeing the most at Kaer Morhen, except for Vesemir, of course. Now, you might think from my descriptions of Geralt, Vesemir and Eskel that the School of the Wolf only produces stoic, quiet, patient witchers, kind of the production factory for silent badasses in the north. Well, if you think that, allow me to correct you, for I introduce to you Lambert, the youngest living member of the school and an undistilled, concentrated, physical manifestation of arrogance, spite and a terrible sense of humor. There really is no better way to describe Lambert than how Geralt describes him in the third game. Wanna hear a limerick? Sure. Lambert, Lambert, what a prick. Not bad. You said it, Geralt. That about sums it up. Lambert is the cocky younger brother in the family, a hothead, flamboyant loudmouth who has precisely zero respect for almost any authority. In the games it is mentioned that he makes friends with a school of the cat witcher. And that is really not surprising in my opinion, in fact it's kind of a natural progression of Lambert's character arc, since even though Lambert is still a wolf and will generally abide by some basic principles of decency and professional honor, he has the aggressive, greedy and generally unpleasant demeanor of a witcher trained by the cat school. Prickly to the bone, always the first to raise his voice in an argument and never the one to shy away from unnecessary bloodshed, Lambert is definitely the least positive remaining witcher in the story. Yet as with all things, there is a reason why Lambert is the way he is. You could say Lambert's father would not have won the Father of the Year nomination if there was such a thing in the North, since he was rather fond of Hooch, which made him significantly less fond of his wife and son. He would often beat his wife bloody, and when he was done with her and still had some strength left in him, took out his remaining anger on the boy. Lambert was beaten often and savagely, and that made his heart grow cold and his temper foul. He and his mother prayed for a day when the gods may seem fit to rid them of the monster they were consigned to live with, and one day it almost seemed that the gods saw fit to grant them their wish. As Lambert's father came stumbling out of the inn, blind as a bat from an overdose of alcohol, he managed to stumble straight into a nest of knickers. This is where his tale should have ended, torn to shreds by a swarm of gnarly little goblins. But fortunately, or rather unfortunately if you ask anyone apart from Lambert's father, he was saved by a passing witcher from the school of the wolf. The Witcher, as was custom if he saved a man from peril by chance, demanded that Lambert's father give him the first thing he sees when he returns to his home. Unfortunately for Lambert, that person was destined to be him. As if to add insult to injury, Lambert became friends, probably for the first time in his life, with a fellow novice in Kaer Morhen, who was then killed just before he could pass to the circle of elements and therefore finish his final trial. In a senseless, perfectly avoidable accident. Life had been cruel to Lambert, and so he began repaying said cruelty with bitterness and anger of his own. Of course, that does not justify or excuse many of his words and actions, but it is just one more reminder that cripples, bastards and broken things in the world of the Witcher are made not born. To put it eloquently, there's no cure for being a cunt. Last but not least, we have Cohen. Cohen is the newest witcher staying at Kaer Morhen, and most likely the youngest as well. However, unlike the others in the old sea fort, he is not of the school of the wolf, at least not originally. Amongst the 
most Witcher guilds, there exists a fraternal compact which prevents infighting amongst Witchers and obliges members of the various schools to help each other whenever possible. And so, when we meet him, Cohen is preparing to spend the harsh northern winter in the old sea fort. As for which school exactly Cohen hails from, we do not know, but we know that he originates from Povis by birth, although this does not seem to really narrow down the possibilities very much. There is a lot of speculation about him being from the cat school, which mostly originates from the time when he appears as a black cat in a dream one of the characters has, but this is not only unconfirmed, but it also makes precious little sense. The witchers of the cat school we meet are all remarkably hostile, volatile and, and mercurial characters, and as we shall soon see, few things are as distant to Cohen as angry outbursts. Cohen is an unusual witcher to say the least, both due to his appearance and his mannerism. He sports a thick black beard, with which he tries to cover up the scars from chickenpox which is quite intriguing in and of itself, since most children in their early age are not affected by chickenpox, and witchers are immune to all common illnesses. Furthermore, his eyes are described as unnaturally bright, even for a witcher, and blood-streaked, crisscrossed with red veins, which according to Triss at least, suggests a complication during his ocular mutations. All of this, to me, suggests that Cohen underwent his trial of the grasses at a much higher age than most witchers, and because of that, his trial did not go as planned. But what is more interesting is that Cohen seems to be the most natural of the five witchers, as strange as that might sound. Triss sees him laughing, genuinely laughing with joy, not in contempt like Lambert or in disbelief and despair like Geralt, and his dialogue with Ciri is quite distinct from the way the other witchers speak to her. In Geralt, Ciri sees a father, in Lambert, Eskel and Vesemir, she sees her uncles, but in Cohen, Ciri always saw a big brother, someone who was more playful and joyous, less serious and brooding than the other inhabitants of Kaer Morhen. Cohen served as Ciri's fencing master and taught her one all-important lesson. Some things are beyond our power to change and there is no point in beating yourself up about them. Be the best you can in all things, and that should always suffice. Yet most curiously, and also most unexpectedly, Cohen enlists in the war. And not like Geralt, who mostly gets dragged into the war by accident, but Cohen actually joins the Temerian volunteers, and even manages to make a name for himself amongst his fellow recruits despite their initial suspicions about fighting side by side with a Hexer. The real question remains, however, why did Cohen do so? Since there are no chapters written from his POV, and he never discusses his motives with any other characters, it can be hard to tell. Mayhaps the harsh words he heard from Triss Marigold during her visit to the old sea fort rubbed off on him more than he cared to admit. Mayhaps he had hoped to rescue someone he cared about, or help a friend in need. And mayhaps, just like Geralt, Quinn simply wanted to do what he deemed was right and just. You can probably tell that from all the witchers we meet, Cohen is definitely my favorite one. Alas, all these clues lead me to believe that Cohen is most likely from the school of the Griffin, the school whose witchers are renowned far and wide for their good nature, easygoing attitude, and a far stricter code of honor, and are generally perceived as the good witchers of the setting. How exactly Cohen's training went about, or why exactly he joined the army, we will probably never know, but he is definitely one of the more interesting and intriguing characters from Kaer Morhen. Yet no matter his personality, relationships or achievements, all these characters have one thing in common, a harsh, rigorous training that took up the better part of their childhood, broke them apart within and without, and reforged them into something harder, stronger, faster, and altogether less human. But that is a story for another day. At the end of the